Hey everyone, Alex Italanda here. Look, it doesn't matter if you're a podcast listener or a podcast creator. Audio is obviously important, whether you're commuting to your job, working from home, or just taking a leisurely stroll. The new Neo earphones from Studio give you that superior quality and sound. With 10mm drivers for a dynamic bass and two air vents to relieve ear pressure, you're immersively transported to the audio world of the podcast you're listening to. You also get 5.5 hours of continuous playtime, which can be extended up to 20 hours with the charging case. And did I mention a free nifty vegan leather case with each order? You get all this plus an additional 15% off when you use the promo code OSTIUM15 at checkout. Another cool thing is that the Neo has an IPX4 ingress rated protection, which is a fancy way of saying it's splashproof. So whether you're at the gym and shedding plenty of sweat, or out for a jog and get caught in the rain, you won't have to worry about your earphones getting wet and have to cut your time short. You can learn all about these amazing earphones at studio.com slash neo-white. That's N-I-O-white. And don't forget to use the promo code OSTIUM15 to get 15% off your order. Okay, one last thing. Did I mention the cool colors the Neo earphones come in? You've got your basic black and white, but also a cool moss green, warm orangey sand color, and even an eye-catching turquoise color called Aurora. I was in the market for a pair of good earphones like the Apple AirPods, but didn't want to pay that hefty price tag, and I've been really happy with my Studio Neo earphones. So head on over to studio.com, that's S-U-D-I-O dot com, And remember to use the promo code OSTIUM15, that's O-S-T-I-U-M-1-5, when you check out to get 15% off your order. Thanks, and enjoy the show. Welcome to our first Tea Break episode of While There Is Tea, There Is Hope, where we sit down and talk with tea lovers, tea drinkers, tea sellers, and tea growers. And I'm really happy to have our guest on today because she does the first three and works directly with tea growers. So it's an ideal first guest to have on the show for our little tea break. Elise, say hi. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks, man. Glad to have you here. Yeah. Um, so if you could do a real quick, a little talk, a little intro about yourself and what TLET is. I know we're going to go into more specifics later on in the interview, but just a little quick little overall. Yeah. Yeah, my name is Elise Peterson, and I am the founder and CEO of TeaLet, which is a B2B marketplace for independent tea growers. Uh, We work with tea growers all around the world, import their teas in bulk, and then distribute them to small to medium-sized tea business buyers. Awesome. Cool. All righty. So when did your love of tea begin, and what's your earliest memory of enjoying tea? Oh man, my love of tea did not begin until after uh, three or four years of studying it. Mm -hmm. And uh, my first experience with tea happened when I was nearly 30 years old. Oh wow. So yeah, yeah, this is a very new thing for me, but I was kind of thwarted into this world very quickly, very, Mm -hmm. very quickly. And I kind of knew going into it uh, that tea was going to consume my life. And little (laughs) did I know the significance tea itself would play. And now Mm -hmm. I'm very proud and I love it <laughs> very much. Uh, I'm, I'm actually a food scientist. So first and mm, foremost, cool. my passion is in food, agriculture, and my love of tea was not found until uh, almost, you know, over a decade um, in that field. Mm. But uh, my first drink of tea uh, was as a quality control uh, supervisor for mm. a very large green tea manufacturer that's based out of Japan. Uh, They Mm -hmm. do have a couple of uh, facilities in the United States. They have distribution into the United States. So I was doing quality control for them. Uh, They make unsweetened green tea. You can find it at Costco. It's a very common uh, widespread product. Um, And uh, it wasn't until a few years after that, that I really learned about tea, where it came from Mm -hmm. and what makes it so special. Uh, what's the name of the tea? Because so we can give it a little link in the show notes. <laughs> uh, for the, 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 the company well, that I worked for? Oh, yeah. And the one from Co- and if you can remember the specific tea that you said. Was yeah, yeah. It, the company is called Itoen, Oyocha. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, you, you know, yeah, it's my roots. It's my story. <laughs> They're a very big, well-known company. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I, I don't work for them anymore. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, actually was very passionate about the product while I was working for them. And wanted to build traceability programs for Mm -hmm. the products to be able to trace 
where tea is coming from to the final right. product so that if there mm-hmm. ever is some type of salmonella outbreak or something, we'd be able to trace it. Uh, but we would receive the tea in these very large super sacks. There was no coating on it. Everything was just kind of a big aggregation. And um, it was when I started asking questions, uh, you know, they told me, oh, you can't uh, do that work because you don't speak Japanese. We're a Japanese company, all that's done in Japanese language. And uh, so I went to go get a Japanese MBA because I thought, mm-hmm. okay, I can go learn Japanese business <laughs> yeah. and then come back and do it. Uh, but it was during that time that uh, I was hired by the um, USDA mm-hmm. and the College of Agriculture at the University mm-hmm. of Hawaii, where I was. Oh, cool. Yeah, uh, I was hired to do a market feasibility study for Hawaii grown tea. So because mm. I had experience with tea and I was an MBA student, uh, I was asked to join the team. And that was when I started working with tea farmers in Hawaii. I even started my own tea garden in Hawaii. I collected oh, a bunch awesome. of genetics from all the tea gardens that I went to. And then, of course, because it was a Japanese MBA, I had to do an internship uh, in, J- in Japan. And, and most of the students mm-hmm. do corporate internships in Tokyo. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm, I come from a background of, of uh, doing the Peace Corps. So I, mm. I really thrive more working in rural communities. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I ended up networking uh, onto a, a tea farm in Kyoto. Mm-hmm. I spent six months uh, living, living there. It's funny because it seems like, well, obviously this is the, the route your your life would take to this point, but it, yeah. you didn't know along the way doing all these no. different things that it would do that. And now it's just like, oh, it all makes sense. It all builds together and becomes yeah. this final product. Yeah. Yeah. No, I'm grateful for it. Uh, it just, it's, it's kind of awkward though, because of my peers in the tea industry, they all have these very large romantic stories about how mm-hmm. they had a childhood uh, association with tea or they had a connoisseur association with tea before they got into the business, but not me. Like I was <laughs> head deep in the business for two years <laughs> until I realized I was actually working with a connoisseur product. Like mm-hmm. uh, from my perspective, first it was a commercial product. Like I knew right. tea as a commercial product. And then I started knowing tea as like a rural farmers type of product. Um, and it, yeah, it took, it took about two or three years of actually selling it, introducing it into the market, seeing people's reaction to, to learn, wow, I'm actually dealing with a really high quality product here and mm-hmm. I need to change all of my language uh, because when I first started, it was very much about the social justice aspect of it, which, mm-hmm. you know, I, I'm, I'm sure you're going to be very interested to hear about and I'm very interested to talk about it. But at the end of the day, what actually moves people to make a consumer purchase and and to make that decision is 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 in the quality of the product. So, yeah. you know, they they love hearing the story of ethics, but it doesn't change their their actual behavior. Right. So you've no doubt tried a number of teas in your time. Can you give a few favorites and why they're your favorites? So there are two teas that changed my life, two categories of teas that Mm -hmm. changed my life. And I'm, you know, excited to hear which those two teas end up being for you Mm -hmm. uh, because they're they're different for everybody. Uh, But the first one um, is uh, Gyokuro. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's a shaded green tea from Japan. Uh, A ceremonial grade matcha is also Mm -hmm. shaded, similarly to Gyokuro Mm -hmm. type senchas. Uh, and that's what makes it so savory and, and, and thick and umami uh, compared to uh, other teas, which are very hot, tannic, you know, high in tannins, which are mm-hmm. astringent and also high in caffeine, which are bitter. Uh, yep. But uh, the, the shaded green teas, uh, it was like, yeah, I was at a, a food expo in Japan when I was doing my internship there. And I was coordinating all of these different tea farmers from around the world at our booth. And there was a farmer from uh, Fukuoka, from Yame specifically. That's like the highest elevation tea growing region of Japan. It's very mm-hmm. famous of the the tea nerds. They know about that. <laughs> and uh, the tea grower uh, said, here is a cup of gyokuro, Yame gyokuro. And, uh, you know, I just casually took it. I was busy, but like, it was like the sip just stopped time around <laughs> me, yes. like that type of thing. Uh-huh. And it just coated the whole mouth and just, I was like, oh, now I get it. Now I understand why people spend more money on, on different types of teas. Mm-hmm. And the, uh, the second other type of tea that changed me and my perception on tea and the connoisseurship of it is Don Songs. Those are Phoenix Mountain oolongs from okay. uh, Guangdong uh, province of China, uh, very close to Chaozhou, which is the birthplace of Gongfu Cha, which is 
the practice, you know, of, of serving tea with intention, mm -hmm. like I, I have here on my tray. Um, it's so aromatic. It It's so aromatic. It makes you feel like it's scented with some perfume. Like most teas are scented, like Earl Grey, those types of yeah, things. Right. They're all like mm -hmm. scented with some type of flavor uh, and you can know it, you know, I guess, especially as a food scientist, that was actually mm -hmm. the area of, of course, study yeah. that I was into was flavor science, mm -hmm. concocting different chemical compounds yeah. to replicate. Yeah. It becomes the almost like something. chemistry in some ways. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's, it's chemistry. <laughs> um, but uh, the Don Song teas, Phoenix Mountain teas, which are, you know, the, the real Don Songs coming from like the first and gener second generation plants from the mother, the original mother plants, you you know, at the mm -hmm. top of the Wudong area, the aroma is just so strong. You would think it's perfumed, but it's not. It's, not. it's just natural. <laughs> it's like it's craft. Wow. And um, there's a lot of secrets, you know, like mm -hmm. even if you talk to tea masters from Taiwan mm -hmm. or Japan and you ask them, how is this tea like this? They won't even know. Um, you know, <laughs> so there's, there's uh, deep secrets, especially in China, Chinese tea uh, making world. There's a lot of secrets um, and, uh, that's what makes the tea so unique, but then there's also a lot of innovation happening too. And there's new teas that mm -hmm. surprise me and shock me, uh, like last year, the tea that brought the most surprise to me was a white tea from Sri Lanka. I was like, wow, this like would have never suspected that. Uh, but it was, uh, it was sweet. It was savory. It was a little spicy. It had this like really complex, bold mouthfeel to it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was coming from the most unlikely place. Yeah, right. What's well, it's so wonderful about this because you have a whole history of tea and everything that's been done. But, and then you've got new technology and new ways that it's always being changed with tea too. There's always so much. So let's talk a little about tea lit. How did it all begin and where did that come from? I mentioned before I I'd worked at a tea company I'd mm -hmm. studied tea and then I did an internship on a tea farm in Japan that was right after the tsunami coming up to its 10-year mm -hmm. anniversary right. so I guess it, I'm aging myself here a little bit <laughs> <laughs> but um I was doing an internship uh and in in the theme of the aftermath of the tsunami, which did affect the tea industry there with all mm -hmm. the radiation and, right. and not even that the farms were directly affected, but the market was affected because like all of Germany completely cut off all right. imports from Japan. They just categorized all, mm -hmm. all products from Japan to be radioactive uh, because they did receive radioactive tea from Japan. And that's a wow. whole other political story, <laughs> but <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway, Japan was the, the government was pushing a lot of initiative to build the Japanese brand up. And mm -hmm. so we were able to utilize some of that initiative to start a nonprofit called the International Tea Farms Alliance. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was part of that project of going to that food expo with all of the tea growers. Uh, we had actually networked with tea growers from Korea, China, Taiwan, Sri Lanka, India. They actually came to Japan. We had the funding to bring them wow. to Japan. And um, we threw a tea festival in the village, mm -hmm. the tea growing village in Kyoto, where we were. And that's where I met all these tea growers and just heard this consistent complaint from them mm -hmm. or, or commentary, I should say, from them uh, that everything is rigged against them. You know, wow. all their local markets, when they when they go take their product to the local markets, they can never get a good price. And some of them have experienced limited ex uh, success with e-commerce. So selling directly to mm -hmm. the tea lovers, they make a lot better money, but they don't know that marketing. It's not possible for right. them to do it yeah. at scale. And um, the nonprofit we didn't see sustainability in that either because none of the farmers had any type of resources to n donate to the nonprofit. So mm -hmm. uh, they said, you know, at least you should go back to the States and figure out some for-profit partner uh, that can still carry on this mission of, of mm -hmm. creating a bridge between the tea growers and the tea lovers. Uh, so the first weekend I got back to Hawaii after six months in Japan, I went to a startup weekend which is a technology entrepreneurial related uh, weekend long mm -hmm. competition. And some friends invited me and said, Hey, you should come just check out the tech scene. Um, I had no experience in tech or entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. I had interest, but no experience. And uh, I ended up getting second place pitching something that I, <laughs> wow. I called T-commerce. I called it T-commerce. 
Uh, but the, the name TLIC came about at the startup weekend because uh, I, I did have a team. I was able to convince two developers to work with me, um, which they were happy about because we ended up winning a prize. You know, oh, awesome. <laughs> everybody, everybody thought of the T, the T, that's not innovative. That's yeah. T, that's boring. <laughs> that's right. Uh, but, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting how technology companies work when it's like the most boring things. If you're bringing an innovative angle to it, it really changes the right. game. Mm-hmm. But uh, these developers... We're saying, you know, T-commerce, that URL doesn't exist. You know, you could try to find some clever way to make a URL with T-commerce in it, but that's not very good. And um, we ended up seeing that T-let was available. Mm-hmm. And I was like, that's got a cool ring to it, T-let, like outlet for T. Mm. Kind of makes sense. That works, yeah. Um, yeah, and so that's where the, the name came from. But unfortunately, the... Uh, the initial logo that was designed, you know, in the the ten minute period that the, the woman put <laughs> yeah. into making a logo for this weekend long competition, actually looked like a, a porcelain bowl with mm-hmm. like three brown greenish little poops falling into the bowl. <laughs> uh, and the 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 font that we used for Tealet made it look awfully a lot like toilet. So <laughs> we had to change that logo really quickly. But, um, you know, we, st- we, we got second place and one of the judges there uh, was a venture partner at 500 Startups, which is one of the more premier uh, early stage uh, venture mm-hmm. capital accelerators in Silicon Valley. And he just, it, it took him not even five seconds to hear my pitch. And he says, <laughs> you know, at least you're friends with these farmers. They're struggling. Make a website, prove to yep. us that you can sell some tea and we'll invest in you. This is exactly what we invest in wow. right now. Cool. And yeah, within five months, I had done an Indiegogo campaign to launch, launched a website, received that funding, spent six months in Silicon Valley, um, networked with investors throughout New York, Chicago. Of course, now I'm in Las Vegas. Mm-hmm. Uh, and we are we are part of the downtown project, which mm-hmm. is part of like a Tony Shea's um, revitalization project mm-hmm. downtown. Um, so, uh, yeah, we are linked in with quite a few prominent venture capitalists, uh, but still at the end of the day, I've realized that I'm, I'm doing something very humble here and, uh, it's seeds. It's a lot of seed planting. So, uh, I have definitely not gone down the traditional VC entrepreneur route that my peers had gone down, but I'm, I'm grateful for it. You know, I raised a very minimal amount of money. And um, really been able to bring the company to a level of profitability on our own that's given us a lot of power and leverage to mm-hmm. make the more long term decisions. Yeah. Uh, that that to I'm, give you that I'm leeway, more prone yeah. to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And also, I just I like the idea, just I feel like that's definitely something the last like five or 10 years that as e commerce has exploded and that we've been able to like, go directly more to people where they are and get whatever products and stuff I'm having to go through companies, big companies and channels and things like that, you know, mm-hmm. that it's, yeah. it's changed it, how we do it. Yeah. 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 But I've learned a lot on that path as well. You know, mm-hmm. so like when I first started, the ideal was direct from farmer to consumer. Mm-hmm. I was like, cut everybody out, cut them mm-hmm. all out. They don't need to be there. And what I've realized over the years now is that maybe they do need to be there. Yes, they do need to be there. Uh, but what they, they need to be is honest. And so what I'm building now is no longer just this farmer's market between the farmer and the buyer, but an entire industry platform where all of what I call proxies, which are other mm-hmm. middlemen, uh, mm-hmm. can have their place. They can find their place uh, and they can exchange value on this platform. Uh, but the only conditions are that they have to be transparent. Mm-hmm. They have to be transparent about what their business does. Uh, the distribution of the monies uh, throughout right. the entire supply chain um, because they are needed. You know, a lot of these farmers, they don't speak English. They live in very rural places that don't have connectivity, um, but they have trusted family members or such that do live in the cities. And uh, we encourage those to create their own autonomous business because then they can be doing this proxying for other yep. farms mm-hmm. as well. Right. There's other outlets other and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's essentially just decentralizing the industry versus um, trying to cut everybody out because mm-hmm. the, 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 those people and their value is, is necessary. We just really have to 
influence a culture of transparency and trust and not have it be just all money driven and looking for profit and success yeah. in that way yeah. and greed and all the bad stuff yeah <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Cause like in the tea industry, like really no one's making money. There's, there's really only, only one point in the industry that's making the money is like the end retail service point. Uh, everybody else is not really making money. Even the importers and traders, like brokers, they're, <laughs> they're struggling too, you know, mm-hmm. and that pressure goes all the way down to the right. farmer and then they have no one left other than their soil and their water. Yeah. They have no one, no one else left for them to, Oppressed. But if you look at the development of the industry, like uh, the Sri Lankan tea industry is a really good model of that. Uh, Lipton was the first company mm-hmm. to go develop uh, tea fields in, 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 in Sri Lanka. They no longer do that. They, they got smart real fast and realized the money is not made in the production side. The money is made on the marketing side. Um, right. And so that's why you don't see any Lipton owned tea gardens anymore. It's, it's, all, um, it's all on the marketing side. But of course, everyone knows the name Lipton <laughs> because, yeah, because they do their marketing. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you've talked about how you've traveled all, and I've seen on your website and things too, how you've traveled really all around the world to these tea places. Can you talk about some of them and, and what they were like? Yeah, uh, they're all very, you know, kind of mountainous. Mm-hmm. <laughs> that, that's a common theme, a lot of mountains. And we always have a, a little running joke in, in our little crew when we travel uh, the gnarlier the road, the better the tea. You know, like the more isolated. Wow, it sounds like a cool and, t-shirt tag. You know, <laughs> <a t-shirt. laughs> yeah. Um, you know, but it's also diverse too. You know, it's not all like high mountain. And mm-hmm. I do like to uh, remind people that that is kind of a myth. Like there is some generalization about high altitude mm-hmm. that does lend itself to greater extremes in temperature throughout the day to the night, which is actually good for tea. Like torture is good, not just for tea, but for a lot <laughs> of agriculture products, like even mm-hmm. human beings, like the, what's the, the, the hero's journey. Like, it's like the, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you go through pain and suffering and you end up the becoming end, to stronger. the ends of the earth. <laughs> yeah. 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 So the same thing is about tea as well. So that's the whole thing with like uh, the matcha and the gyokuro when they shade the leaf, it's a pretty sad, pathetic looking situation. The leaf it's just like wilted and like sad. All it wanted to do was breathe. You know, you're essentially suffocating it uh, by doing that. Uh, but so that's a high mountain, but it, with good care and with good artistry and craftsmanship and an intimate connection with your plant and your soil and your environment and your processing, really good tea can be made at lower elevations. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's not a direct rule of thumb. Um, so, you know, that's why I like to remind people that good tea does come from uh, the valleys and, you know, like Assam. Assam mm-hmm. is, is not a high elevation uh, uh, cl- uh, area. Uh, and I'm not saying that all Assam tea is good. Most of it's terrible. And most of it is, is filled with like really bad energy and indentured labor and human right. trafficking mm-hmm. and a lot of really sad stuff. Assam yeah. is, uh, yeah. But there's a lot of really good teas coming from Assam as well. Uh, small family farms that are separating themselves mm-hmm. from the commercial industry and figuring out how to, you know, do good tea on your own. Uh, it's pretty magical. So that's the common theme that I do mm-hmm. see is is family, community, craftsmanship, pride, um, a lot of very like enthusiastic young people that are getting into it. That always makes me really that's excited great. to see yeah. young people like 15, 16 year old. Last uh, two years ago when I went traveling, the best tea of my trip was coming from a 16 year old in Nepal. Wow. That's amazing. And, you know, he's just like, he's of the TikTok era, mm-hmm. you know? So like he's, in, he's, but, but instead of like wanting to do his dance moves and stuff, like mm-hmm. he's, he's seeing this pride in, in, in the suffering that's happening around him. You know, the other families that are mm-hmm. there at this point, there's a lot of families in Nepal not even being paid for their green leaf. Wow. Um, so there's a lot of suffering going on. And he sees himself as this point of shining in, in, in his community of, of creating a future for them where they're actually treated with dignity. Um, and you have such reach with TikTok these days that it, you know, it goes around the world in minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not, I'm not so enthusiastic about TikTok. I don't know. Maybe it's because I haven't cracked it yet. But um, 
I'm much more enthusiastic about, about things like Twitch and Reddit, but, um, I, I just use the example TikTok because yeah. uh, I think a lot of people like look down on Gen Z as like not being engaged and, mm-hmm. and, and being just kind of disconnected and, and, and finding the sillier things to do with the internet versus the better things. And I don't think that's it. I think uh, I've, I've been really impressed with a lot of the young people I've been exposed to in the past couple of years. Um, you know, just talking very mature and understanding mm-hmm. concepts like uh, emotional intelligent concepts that whenever I was younger, didn't even exist, you know? Right. So uh, you hinted I've heard a little bit about you're going on a trip in the near future. Can you talk about that? Yeah, I am. I'm going to be going probably on several trips. Um mm-hmm just because there's, there's a lot to figure out on this. But uh, every spring, I go on something called the Amazing Tea Race. Uh, and mm. that's, that's just marketing. But <laughs> it's pretty amazing. And it's tea and it's racing around. Um, but uh, we uh, travel. Well, first, it was just me and my brother. I co-founded mm. the business with my brother. He's a media guy. He's a filmmaker. So uh, he would uh, bring all the camera gears and everything. And <laughs> we'd be climbing up the mountains to get the videos of the farmers. Uh, but we traveled to meet with all the growers. Um, and so it would take a, a little over two months. Uh, and like every three days, we'd be on a plane or a train or mm-hmm. driving across the country. Uh, and we'd go visit all the tea fields. So the first flush happens in the spring. And it kind of, it moves. It starts from Sri Lanka, South India, moves up India to Nepal, China, and then, you know, Taiwan and, and Japan is last. Um, mm-hmm. And so within that two-month period, you can kind of watch the the first flush which is huh. this behind me right here this is the first flush cool. this is the new shoot the new baby shoot that comes up uh in the springtime the all the tea plants go dormant during the winter and then in the spring the new shoot comes out and that's what's harvested uh to make the new teas um and it's a highly coveted thing uh back in the day they <laughs> used to have this thing called uh, the great tea race which was a, a very famous uh, race to be the first company to bring tea to London. Mm-hmm. And actually uh, the famous clipper ships were mm-hmm. developed specifically for that race, specifically for the tea trade, which I think is kind of cool. Uh, you know, the modern day barges and container ships have yeah. since taken over that, <laughs> but there's a little issue this year with those barges and container mm-hmm. ships. They're all backed up and they're backed right. up for, months and months yeah, and months i've heard about that yeah it, it's a problem yeah it's not a problem just for tea it's a problem for the entire world Everything, like if yeah. you're trying mm-hmm. yeah if you're trying to get anything out of china right now they're not even booking shipments right now mm-hmm. um you could do air freight but air freight is costing a lot of money right now so uh there's a big question in the industry about how we're going to get these new first flush teas to time, the market right. quickly and affordably um, there's really not a solution to it. And so I've been waiting. I've been waiting for my opportunity to jump and become a legitimate powerhouse in the industry. You know, not just for myself and my own mm-hmm. ego, but for this business right. that I'm, yeah. this mm-hmm. like opportunity for these farmers that I've been trying to build like a legitimate business opportunity. And uh, so I've decided I'm going to take it into my own hands. And uh, yeah, I'll be going to Asia and I will be hiring a boat, preferably a, a sailboat, not a full sailboat. Like uh, we'll have an engine on it. That'll be important. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> everybody keeps asking me that. They're like, Is, you're just going to sail. You, you know, you're going to lose one of your crew. And I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> There's going to be a motor on it. We're not going to be completely motorless. Uh, but yeah, we're going to, um, we're going to physically bring the tea back ourselves. That's amazing. <laughs> um, and, and this is part of like a bigger plan and it's something that I've been thinking about for a while too. It's not, uh, there's a lot of spontaneity going on here, but mm-hmm. I've been thinking and, and joking and talking about this for a long time, uh, just because the cargo ships are terrible for the environment. I've heard if you were mm-hmm. to take the, the carbon emissions of the container cargo industry and compare it to the countries in the world it would be the sixth largest wow. polluter 
And of course, whenever there's any sort of accident with them or whatever, it's just devastating for wherever it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. but even just burning the fuel to get across Mm. the ocean, it's... Because again, they want to get there fast, so they want to go as fast as they can. Yeah, and they use the cheapest fuel. They they use like the Mm -hmm. lowest grade fuel that burns the least clean, but no one cares about the ocean. No one ever talks, cares about the ocean. So we always forget about it, you know? Um, So yeah, I'm really enthusiastic about offering a solution and this is not just a one-off thing uh what what i would like to see is like a regular circulation of of vessels uh decentralizing that cargo Mm -hmm. i I, i'm a big fan of decentralizing everything like we uh we're actually one of the first bitcoin merchants in the world Mm -hmm. Uh, we're very enthusiastic on cryptocurrency and just the idea of distributing uh, the the distribution of power you know, not, not just being the one to hold all the power, but to, to find power in collaboration. Um, so yeah, I'd like to see that. And uh, maybe I'll become a prolific circumnavigating uh, sailor by the end of all of this. I, I wouldn't There's be, something about I, this too, with, you know, with how the whole tea industry started hundreds of years ago with these ships racing, but now it's being done for, you know, in better ways and for better reasons and all this stuff. Yeah. Anyway, I think. Yeah. Well, I came to learn, Alex, uh, yesterday I was talking with an industry friend who mm-hmm. let me know that there is an initiative in the UK to bring back the clipper ships. And they do have a clipper ship race that will be happening next year. And it's a big deal. It's all, it's like NASCAR type of a thing. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just like, and they cite back to the great tea races. Like when you look at the history, it's like, yeah, the clipper ships were for the tea trade. This was the routes that they took. Mm-hmm. And I'm wondering, like my friend is going to try to put me in contact with them. But I'm just wondering, like, is this just going to be a gimmick or are we actually going to put some tea on those boats? Because right. <laughs> you're ready. You're ready to do it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and again, it's all about the marketing. So you can just do all this thing and then the world wants yeah. to get behind it and make it happen. Yeah. 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 So that, the, the, that is the goal. Um, I'm no longer saying I'm manifesting this to happen. Like last <laughs> month I was saying I'm manifesting it. Now I'm doing it. Like I, I don't have the boat secured as of right now, but mm-hmm. those things will work out. I definitely have connected with a few skippers um, that are excited to work with me, like pretty much anybody in the sailing world or in the cruising world as like the, the casual, more personal sailors, uh, call mm-hmm. it, uh, everybody's enthusiastic about it. So I don't think that I'll have a problem executing this. Um, and I'm looking forward to telling the story. Cause I think telling the story is going to be definitely a yeah. very big part of the it. Journey. And yeah. I've been, uh, becoming you know, quite proficient with live streaming and have built an audience on Twitch and that audience mm-hmm. is just growing. And I think offering this type of content would just explode it. I, I think it would go crazy, but um, kind of hard to get the internet in the middle of the ocean. So uh, I am uh, currently working on a campaign to ask, ask some uh-huh. folks for, for help on that, get a, get a satellite on my boat. There you go. Yeah. Cause my, my dad's, well, we used to be big sailors in my family. My dad was and stuff. And he tells me all the time about these YouTube videos he watches of these people sailing around the world and documenting everything they do. And they, they put it all up on YouTube and they make you know good money mm-hmm. off of it. So it's there. Yeah. yeah it's <laughs> so it's there. actually, uh, it's a good segue here. Cause I was going to want to bring up, talk about your, your live streams that you do. So you don't just do in little tea things. I mean, they're, they're, they're big things that you do with your, can you talk a little bit about your, your videos you do? Live yeah, 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 yeah. So I didn't always live stream, uh, but mm-hmm. we have been a video company from day one. Like I said, mm-hmm. I was working with, with my brother. brother. He's a mm-hmm. filmmaker. And video was always a big part of our platform. Um, mm-hmm. So, you know, we have the videos on our website. Like when you navigate through our website, you can yep. see videos of the farmers. You can see videos of the TV being processed. Um, and also we license out that content to our buyers. And that's been like a big perk as being a marketplace Right. It's always a challenge in marketplaces is when you introduce the two, sometimes they leave <laughs> your platform to go do business outside. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So uh, the the media that we license to the buyers, which they can then use in their marketing, is a free perk of working on our platform. So, you know, the video has been really important for us. And the live stream, live streaming didn't come out until last year when the pandemic started. And a lot of my marketing, actually all of my marketing, is reliant upon public speaking and Mm -hmm. networking at tea festivals. Tea festivals Mm -hmm. are happening at least once a month throughout the country. Um, There's 
there's quite a large one in San Francisco. There's one in Seattle, Portland, LA. I host one here in Vegas. They're everywhere. And so I'm constantly traveling to these tea festivals, giving presentations and then supporting my clients that are selling mm-hmm. tea at the, the festival. So I couldn't do that without travel. Right. And I'm thinking, how am I going to keep this rolling? And then I had my own personal issue with what am I going to do with my time? Like, <laughs> I have to sit in Vegas for a questionable amount of time. Like I've never done that before. Shut I'm, down always, and yeah. <laughs> I've always been traveling. What am I going to mm-hmm. do? How am I going to keep myself sane? And so I decided to live stream. I was not a professional streamer in the beginning. Mm-hmm. It was, uh, yeah, but it, it was, and I already had an audience of people that wanted to learn about tea. So it was mm-hmm. good. I had the good content and I had the audience ready to listen. Um, but you know, in the year's time, uh, live streaming almost every day for at least wow. two or three hours a day, you get a lot of practice, you get a lot of proficiency. And, uh, so yeah, now I've got my entire warehouse is set up into a studio. I've got like a full green screen room, like where I am right now. Uh, over there, I have a stage, so I can invite musicians or artists mm-hmm. in. Oh, wow. And uh, I've got another little stage over here. Last time, I had a girl doing, like, sound healing, sound singing bowls. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I just stream. I stream to Twitch. I have different themes every day. Um, we have quite a following. Um and a year uh, ago, it, never, it didn't even exist. <laughs> That's amazing. Well, yeah. So like a year ago, <laughs> Twitch was really just video mm-hmm. games. It was only yeah. just starting to branch out of the video game scene. And the pandemic really threw it when uh, I think food and drink, like the the arts and crafts and food and drink is really what blew it up, especially food mm-hmm. and drink, because when the pandemic happened, a lot of chefs lost, lost their jobs. Right. Mm-hmm. And they, they realized, hey, I can go on to Twitch and start making some money. And now they have like thriving cooking shows and communities around it. And so then the tea girl comes in and, you know, I'm like, oh, tea. And they're like, I love tea. I love masala. No, no, they, I love chai tea. How many times yeah. I hear that? Chai tea is my favorite. And I'm like, oh, so you like tea tea. Good. <laughs> yes, exactly. We made that joke on the podcast a few times. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's my main Twitch joke. Cause you know, and then it, then they say, what? Uh, tell me more. I want to learn more about tea. And yeah. uh, it's, it's, it's become a really sexy, interesting thing for people. I'll tell you what, when I started 10 years ago, tea was not sexy. I had to freaking dress up like a lunatic and, <laughs> you know, do tea parties on the streets to get people uh, interested in tea. But the game has really changed a lot. Uh, the young uh, Gen Z, mostly male demographic has really uh, gotten into tea. You know, it's like an interest of, of getting into things and alcohol is not as cool anymore as it used to be. A sober lifestyle is much more cool now. And so tea falls into that, but tea's got some magical chemical properties in it that keeps you hooked, you know, Mm -hmm. like the intrigue and the culture and the art may be what interests you. Uh, But once you start drinking tea, uh, your brain feels better. Your body feels more relaxed, more cool and confident. So I think that, you know, tea is the nootropic of the gods and you know, <laughs> nootropics are so popular right now. Um, people are seeking that attention and focus and, and relaxation. Um, and I, I don't think that tea is marketed enough in mm-hmm. that sense. Um, I think people will get it eventually. I mean, I, I teach all of my clients because they tell me, hey, you know, people come in asking for health claims on tea. What should I tell them? And it's like, don't tell them anything because any health claim on tea requires a lifetime of drinking it every day. <laughs> you can't, you can't sell that, um, you know, on the first purchase, but what yeah. you can sell to them is that the tea is going to make them feel calm and cool and smart. Everybody wants to feel calm and cool and smart, you know? Um, and, and so it's just more about finding the teas and drinking the teas on a daily that you really like and really enjoy and really feel cool and confident and smart when you drink, so, um, uh, because then those other website benefits for a little will bit. So can anyone in, just buy tea know. through there or do they have to go through a store or how can we do it? Yeah. So, um, tea light is my wholesale website. So mm-hmm. we, we specifically do B2B wholesale supply chains management since the pandemic and doing the live streaming and connecting more broadly with the consumer base, I mm-hmm. had to set up a retail website. And so that's mm-hmm. a whole separate website rather okay, than right. trying to have different yeah. portals. 
I just built a whole separate website and the name of that one is T and it's people.com. Hmm. And that it. one hosts <laughs> our community as well as the retail catalog. Cool. So what do you want people to take away from T-Let, from learning about T-Let? T, T will save the world if we let it. <laughs> okay, that's you another know? good T-shirt slogan. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. T-Let has great T-shirts. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's it. It's as simple as that. And, and we're all a part of it. it you know, it's, it's only going to save the world if we allow it to. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that's getting in touch with the history of tea, getting in touch with the quality of tea and the enjoyment and the social aspect of tea, trying to build, you know, our friend circles around tea. Mm-hmm. If, if we can do that as individuals, as the world, Man, some really incredible things Sky's that can happen bit. in this world. <laughs> we, we, we really do need to see. Yeah. <laughs> so where would, do you see things going for the future with TLET? What, what are you hoping for next? So we will start to diversify into other agriculture commodity networks. Uh, first would be Ayurvedic herbs, such as like turmeric mm-hmm. and ginger, Tulsi, those types of things. Uh, then maybe into other commodities like cacao, spices, mm-hmm. coffee. Uh, and, you know, eventually what I'm trying to build and, and, and offer into this world is a, a, a corporate powerhouse that is built from the ground up with this mindfulness of mm-hmm. transparency and trust yeah. and consent. Um, that that does not exist in any other corporate context. It doesn't. It really doesn't. You know, yeah. all this fair trade, B Corp, like the deeply rooted in its core values. Um, it's still like that profit only driven, which my company, of course, we've got balance sheets and stuff we got to yeah. maintain. But um yeah, I, I would just want to see much more trust and transparency happening at scale and and uh, more power to the smaller businesses. There's nothing mm-hmm. wrong with small businesses. They're great. Great. Cool. All right. So final question. Um, what do you have to say for someone wanting to try tea for the first time? Uh, have fun. <laughs> yeah, just have fun um, and just be present. Like, that's it. Like, even if you become a master tea taster, a master tea sommelier, that's the trick is, is, is being present. And the thing that kind of pisses people off the most when they go through the whole process of studying, mm-hmm. doing certifications and classes is, and they get to that point where they feel like, oh, I've, I've done it. And it's that's like, oh, that was thing. easy. <laughs> All I had to do was just know my feelings, you know, and be present, you know, mm-hmm. like if, if you go into something feeling like I need to master this, I need to listen to every detail. I need to know everything and do it perfect. It's going to be really hard to, to be present because there's always going to be that anxiety or that. Mm-hmm. All these preconceived that, that notions thought. and stuff. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So for anybody drinking tea, I just have fun, be present. Don't have any preconceived ideas about it. Um, and, and don't let yourself get any because it is possible in the journey of tea to uh, fall into certain dogmas or certain, they exist, they exist in all, all of the world, um, especially in like niche, high appreciation type communities. You know, they, they have to do it this way or else it's <laughs> yeah. wrong. It's like, no, there's no <laughs> wrong way to be yeah. yourself. <laughs> Especially with teas when there's so many kinds and everything. Yeah, you you find what works for you. All right, well, thank you so much for doing this. And we'll have all the details about Tea Lit and all your various sites in our show notes for this episode. Cool, yeah. And I look forward to listening to your other episodes and and hearing you guys drink the teas. I specifically (laughs) chose teas that, you know, have intriguing stories. So, like, yeah, try to uh, just Google search, like, Tea Lit and the tea name. And Mm -hmm. it'll give you the page with the whole story of the tea. And you can read about it as you're drinking it.